everybody. Thanks again for uh, joining me at Border City Rock Talk, where you get the best news and the best interviews. Uh, before I get to, to my legend from down under, uh, just reminding you to hit that guitar logo right over there on your right and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any interviews. I've got Mike Reno of Loverboy coming up the new year, King Diamond and Merciful Fate coming up, and many, many more. Uh, without further ado, I have the legend from Down Under, Angry Anderson from Rose Tattoo. How are you doing, Angry? Ah, good day. I'm, uh, well, I'm great. It's uh, it's early in the morning. I, I forgot to check what time it is with you, but it's about quarter past 10 a.m. Um, I've been up since uh, I got up about five and walked the dog and, you know, got my day started so right now i'm having my morning coffee and it just synchronizes perfectly with talking to you well right on i'm having another coffee it's six o'clock here in canada on thursday um a.m p.m uh p.m so we're you're PM, yeah i thought so yeah you're 16 hours ahead of us so that's right yeah so anyways um just for the few people uh, in North America, around the world that doesn't know Angry Anderson, obviously he's a legend down under. Actually, Angry, when I think of uh, Australian music, what comes to mind, just because of my age, I got Air Supply, I've got NXS, I've got Kylie Minogue, Keith Urban, and then you've got ACDC and Rose Tattoo. So you're definitely a legend in my books. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. You. In the last few years, I've done a little bit more research on... Uh, What's going on with Rose Tattoo? And um, I kind of uh, come to understand that not only were you a single parent, actually, last night I watched True Stories, which was a documentary about you, uh, about in 2006. You're a single parent, TV personality, you've appeared in numerous movies as cameos, you've ran for political office, you're a youth advocate, um, and you've won awards for that. What's left? Is there anything on your bucket list that you haven't done yet besides music that you want to accomplish? Uh, well, yeah. there's recreational things, of course. I mean, um, when I say I'm looking forward to retirement, that's not quite true. I'll accept retirement gracefully, um, as we all must do with the passing of time. Um, so, you know, I intend to... Um, um, I've done a lot of camping when I was when I was younger, and I, I did a lot of camping with my my children when they were younger. We we now we want to resume that, and it's a very natural. Um, I've found um, it's a very natural evolution of of, um, of of a child's growth that when they uh, during teenage years, particularly later in the teenage years, in early twenties, they might and usually do lose interest in something like camping, but then. When they get into their late twenties or their thirties, as my boys are, mm -hmm. um, now all of a sudden they they remember those amazing childhood memories and they want to relive them or create new ones. So right. we're, we're going to start camping. So that's one of the things that we're going to do. I mean, um, the part of the bucket list was the AA band, which um, folks, brothers and sisters, it doesn't stand for Alcoholics <laughs> Anonymous. It stands for Angry Anderson by initials. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, so the realization of the AA band has been, uh, you know, a long time coming. And um, um, I've, I've always wanted, excuse me, just for that. Okay. Um, I've always wanted to to um, have a band that was uh, vastly different from, obviously, the, the Rosy Tarts, mm -hmm. because um, uh, that's about as heavy as I wanted to go, um, mm -hmm. as far as an intensity, if you like. Um and, and my, my other favourite music, my other favourite, my favourite band of all time was The Faces uh, with Rod Stewart out front. And, right. um, well, the small, the small Faces and then The Faces. Yeah. But um, I've always wanted to do a band that's, that's base, the basis of the music is, is soul, R&B, you know. Right. Uh, even going back to my earliest recollections of music, which was gospel music. Um, I, I very right. much love um uh, and i would like to do a you know like a contemporary or a modern adaptation if you like or or representation of of gospel music um i i think um part of that is it, it's it's not a it's so i mean most of us live by christianic principles without being overly religious or overly right. uh, dogmatic in, in the practice of our religion but most of us do believe in 
a, a spiritual base for a, a, a good life. Especially, and I think especially these God, days. Hmm? Especially these days. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's lacking right. today. I think, what, I think one of the things that young people, and I've dealt, you know, as you say, and I'm, I'm very grateful for your acknowledgement of my, um, of my awards and achievements, or the, the awards came um, uh, in course from the achievements. But, um, and, and, I, and I'm very comfortable now in my 70s. I'm very comfortable with that sort of accolade because it, it, in the early days, I was very uncomfortable Mm. um with the with it the, with the attention and and um because that's not why you set out to right. try and make your life uh, or the world a better place i was i was brought up uh by a single mother um right. uh, we had a very very um a very intensely uh, uh negative experience with my biological father he was right, an extremely that. violent man um, emotionally, physically, and um, certainly he had no spiritual basis to him. Right. But anyway, having said that, um, yeah, my adherence to uh, the gospel music is is the inspiration that produced it, which is faith. And uh, I think that what's lacking today, and I think one of the things that a lot of young people, when 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 they know something's missing in their life. They've not been brought up with a very strong, most, the majority of people these days don't have a very spiritual connection. Um, now, religion provided that for people in the past. In my experience, of course, it's a personal experience. And my connection is to the divine, to, right. the, to, to, to the, uh, the creational process itself. So mm -hmm. life, in other words. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I would like to, I think Rose Tattoo has made uh and i'm very proud of the fact that i've been part of rose tattoos um contribution to 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 heavy rock or blues we're just a very a very loud blues band really very very loud aggressive blues band yeah. but um that was my inspiration my earliest in, inspiration was the blues music which of course derives from gospel and is soul right um and I, so I want to, I've come full circle. I mean, the, uh, there's life in the tats yet. I mean, oh, yeah. um, we're, plan, we're planning, a, 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 you know, like to change the lineup from time to time to keep it interesting. And, mm -hmm. and so that before it's done, before it's over, um, we get as many people through the band, um, um, it, it, not a proliferation of people, but, but certain people. Right. Um, that I that I believe can contribute to the legacy, if you like. Uh, Absolutely. And so, you know, we're planning a new album uh, for next year. Another and, one. Uh, but, hmm? Another one. W with the tats, yeah. Yeah, with, but you uh, just released Outlaws. Uh, yeah, I mean that that was a re-record, as you understand. I mean, it's yeah. got three new tracks. Yeah. Um, uh, we can talk about uh, that. The addition to that. To the, those three tracks, the reason that I, when we did the re-record, um, to to bring about uh, um, uh, the acknowledgement um, of of the legacy that that myself and this present lineup enjoy, um, it's well over forty years. I think it's 44, 45 years now. Yeah. Um, since the since the band became a name, or the name is a band. Um, uh yeah the three extra tracks are interestingly enough uh the three tracks that didn't make the original cut so i was determined i mean <laughs> i'm a very patient man when it comes to getting my own way yeah and i i i really wanted those three tracks on the original album but i saw the wisdom um at working with harry and george in albert's records i understood the wisdom of 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 not having them because because of, of the the now, when you look at the original album, it's a very it's a you know it's a real variety plate. It's um you know there's a, there, there, there's a theme if you like, or there's a feeling of a band there, but all the songs are quite different from one another, which is which is pretty cool. Right. right. Interestingly enough, the um, Rosetta, which is one of the uh, uh, the additional tracks on the re-record, yeah. that was my vote for. You know, because uh, George and Harry said, look, have you got anything that sort of is a softer song, you know, like without losing its integrity? Yeah. And we put up we put up Rosetta and 
but the, the track that made it onto the album is Stuck On You, which is a nonsensical little song, really. Yeah. Um, the chorus is written about, is, is written uh, in honour of my mother, whose name is Rose May, um, or yeah. Rose of May. She's a French Creole. She's from an island called Mauritius. Oh, no. And, yeah. Uh, which is, which is, yeah, which is out near Madagascar. Right. And, um, yeah, so um, George just loved Stuck On You so much that that made it on the album and Rosetta didn't. But And I'm very, very pleased with the new recording of Rosetta. But, um, yeah, so I, I suppose bucket list-wise, as far as music goes, I don't think there's much more I want to do, but I, I think the new band will lead me personally um, in... Uh, in in some directions which I think might surprise some people, and I think no more than the than the uh, the single the, the the first single yeah we'll get from, to that. from the impending album which is yeah. realised legalised and yeah. it's copped a, it, I I think uh, in in the most part it's positive feedback but there's been yeah. a bit of negativity from I suppose the diehards and said oh you know mm -hmm. um, it, I think it's a, it, You've heard the track, yeah, yeah. So before, how, we, how would you describe it, genre-wise? Um, well, I would describe it um, as as it's um, kind of a funk, kind of a groove. Yeah, that's that's the way ahead. I would describe it. But before we yeah. get into that, um, uh, getting honest about the, uh, your your drug issue, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about. Um, just a really quick question about Rose Tattoo. My favorite album, and it's kind of a romantic album. I don't know why that term comes to mind, but Southern Stars. I love every song on the, on the album. It just brings me to a place where I wish I lived in Australia. Now, what would your favorite album be if you had to pick one and why? Uh, I, am, I am thrilled to my back teeth that you have picked Southern Stars. I am so... I am emotional about it because um not that i regret recording it with the lineup that we did but um because that was a terrific lineup and it was in it was in it was to it was to uh, cap off our relationship with um with alberts and um some of the songs were written around about the time uh, lyrically of um the scarred for life album yeah and um i think i think if there's if if, if i was to choose a favorite it would be scarred only because um <clears throat> a scarred for life for a start is uh, a phrase i remember i think i was 17 um might have been 18 but um i'd been tattooed uh, for about um probably a year if not a year but close around about a year i had uh, a, a tattoo on each uh, upper arm here right um and both roses one was a red rose with an anchor and the other one was a, a black rose with a tombstone because i just recently lost a dear friend the drummer in the band that i was in at the time right um he died tragically um the other one was in acknowledgement of my mother whose right. name is, as I said, Rose of the May or Rose de May in French. Anyway, I'd had these tattoos for, you know, quite some time, probably around about a year. Um, and I was underage, obviously, when I was first tattooed, right. legally speaking. Yeah. And my mother had never seen them. I remember the story. She didn't know I was tattooed. And the only people that got tattooed where I were were, 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 were bad people. Not so much bad people, but they were considered to be like louts, uh, you know, um, juvenile delinquents, um, people that have gone to jail um, or yeah. had been in jail or should be in jail, um, <laughs> and people in the armed forces. Right, right. And um, in an effort to fit in, and I'd always been fascinated by tattoos because um, my biological father's two older brothers who served, one, one was a flyer and the other one was in the army, both were tattooed. And they'd been in the services, so they were tattooed. So I was fascinated by the, you know, the um, uh, 
the vision, if you like, the, the visuals of being tattooed. Plus the fact that it, it, it was a gang thing when I grew up. I mean, if you right. were tattooed, right. you, you, you belong to that sector. And I, you know, I suppose as a kid, I desperately wanted to mark myself right. as, as, as I say, um, in the song, you know, I could, I took a stand for an outlaw's life and right. my ma's words are ringing. And she said this when she discovered that I was tattooed immediately. She tried to scrub them off. That's right. I she... saw that. <laughs> until she actually drew blood, which was, and then she <laughs> gave up in tears because she used one of those hard bristle, you know, uh, brushes that you use. Yeah, that you the people in the old days used to scrub everything that needed scrubbing, you know, like uh, a, a good scrubbing. Yeah. And um, as, as she walked away, she turned back um, with tears in her eyes and she said, oh, Gary, Gary, you're scarred for life. Okay. And, and she walked through the door. And even though, you know, the worst thing you can do to your mother is reduce her to tears. But yeah. And uh, it was a turning point in my life because I, I ran straight to my room and I wrote down, you're scarred for life. And I thought, that's just fucking amazing. What a great line. Little did I know, of course, that years and years later, I would write a song about that, my teenage experience. Did you uh, uh, get yeah. your royalties off the song? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, <laughs> I've lyric, I mean, I've contributed... Um, uh, lyrically to, to every song but yes I mean I have I have actually in a, in a roundabout way I have um, thanked mum over and over again I mean you know like we've, I've, we've lost mum to dementia which is very sad but Sorry to hear that. Um, in, in the years after that you know as I, as I became uh, you know like or particularly with television become a hat like we, we, we really discussed um, as two adults, uh, we needed to talk about our early life together and how, how bad or tragic or sad or, or uh, destructive it was. Mm -hmm. um, I was going through therapy at the time and it was important to, to, to talk to mum, even though it was painful for both of us, that, yeah. we, that we brought up the past so that we could deal with it and then just leave it where it where it belonged which is in the past and because you know as we both understand it's tragic to carry the weight of something that happened 20 years ago in your life right. or 30 years ago through the rest of your life and that's why they call it baggage i mean it, it yeah. weighs you down you know so right. yeah so um yes i i made it up to her but then again um i spent as most sons do um, I spent the greater part of my life trying to not repay my mother because it's the wrong choice of words, but to acknowledge and honour um, my mother's con her contribution to my life. Just like you've uh, raised uh, your kids as a single parent, she had to do the same, correct? Yeah, I. Um, <clears throat> when I say single parent, I mean... Um, even when we we were married, um, my the mother of the children um, has has had to deal her whole life with uh, similar circumstances to mine as a child. Okay. Um, sh she was severely abused, and and that's marked her quite tragically. And so she was through no fault of her own, uh, to a degree. Um, right. You know, she she found it very difficult. To function on a normal level so um part of the reason that um in those early 80s my first well, our first child was born in 83 my daughter uh, our daughter um, um and around about that time of course at the um uh, we were touring america and um i suppose the pressure got to everybody anyway we came back to australia and the band fell apart and um, and I was able to be a full-time parent then. And luckily, as would have it, um, work that I'd been doing with um, some um, male, particularly male youth, but not exclusively, there was a few young girls involved with um, street youth. And um, I came to the attention of television. I spent the next uh, 10 years 
working in television, um, as well as, you know, keeping up sort of music as well. But um, I was able to focus on being a parent. So I was, I was very fortunate in that sense. Of course, when the marriage finally inevitably broke up, mm -hmm. um, um, the children one by one came to me. And um, uh, so, it, you know, by the time they were all turned 12, uh, which in Australia is is when the courts recognise that they can uh, make uh, decisions about where they want to live and how they want to live, right. because you know after twelve, of course, they're thirteen, so they 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 no no longer considered children per right. se, yeah. even though they still are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I spent many many years um, with, uh, pardon me, two or three of them, or even four of them. Yeah. Um, in residence <laughs> and um and that's why that when you were saying before about when i my well, one of my daytime jobs was um and nighttime job was cleaning mm -hmm. houses mm -hmm. and offices etc um in a way to supplement you know i wasn't earning a huge amount of money from music right um okay let's get let's delve into your drug addict drug problem <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I no uh, longer have a problem. I can afford it. Boom, boom. <laughs> who, who, who told me that? Who said that before? Um, oh, I was watching. I think Charles. Oh, it's, a, bit, it's a famous quote. It's, yeah, um, definitely. It's definitely a famous yeah. quote. Yeah. Um, so real I would have thought. It, I thought. I would have thought it was Stephen Tyler, who was. Um, um, I you know I love Stephen Tyler. I think he's just a, a magic human being. I mean, yeah. great front man. Um, and when we toured with them, um, uh, I was introduced, which was in America, um, yeah. and and we toured with them out here as well when they came out. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I found the um, I was introduced to the delights of a hundred percent cocaine, which was uh, quite yeah. a a mind-boggling experience but that was many 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 years ago now yeah so with realized legalized you the mm -hmm. well your first release um from the angry anderson band um i know the background but tell the viewers the background of what that song is about and the political climate that you're facing in australia for the reason you wrote it uh, okay. Um, it was written around about, I think, uh, 77, 78, uh, I think pr pr pretty much 78. Um, we were four piece then. Um, we, we'd lost a guitar player and we had a, a, a legendary guitar player called Lobby Lloyd come into the band and we needed a bass player to keep working. So we worked as a four piece and, and we, we actually went through some pretty interesting times musically, um, uh, because lacking the extra guitar, uh, we weren't sort of playing. We were still playing the same songs, but they they had a different uh, uh, arrangement, so to speak, musically to them. And we were writing some uh, original material. Now, around about that time, uh, Lobby was very, very supportive of a fledgling movement that was coming out of Melbourne, which is, you know, we're, I'm from Melbourne. But we were living in Sydney, of course. And um, which was the marijuana party. And what was happening, um, of course, from the early 70s, and, and there was a, a growing number of young people that were ending up with um, criminal records and, and or jail terms, albeit maybe only 18 months or two years or whatever, mm -hmm. for uh, using and supplying uh, marijuana. Yeah. Um, and I think these days, I don't think there's too many people that don't see um the injustice in that if you like um oh, or right. and or um the, the the you know the the ignorant ignorance of it i mean people were caught drunk driving right and right. And, and and got a fine um now as a drunk driver we all know that you know you can do far more damage than if you're caught smoking marijuana i mean oh, you know um, clearly, absolutely. And uh, anyway, long story short, so we wrote a, they wanted to write, uh, the, the marijuana party was just getting on, on its, onto its feet. And so they asked a few bands um, if they would write songs in support of their cause. So Lobby came to us and said, look, you know, the marijuana party, blah, blah, blah. And we said, yeah, yeah, that's cool. 
um, you know, because we didn't want to see young people with criminal records, and we, mm -hmm. particularly in their teens, I mean, we just kind of stayed with them for a greater part of their life. And we certainly didn't want to see young people going into, you know, mainstream jail because, um, you know, it's a hard place to be. Right. So, uh, very supportive of, of the decriminalization, I mean, let alone the legalization, but the decriminalization of, of uh, possession and use of, of marijuana. So, having said that, that was, you know, like, like I said, you know, that was uh, 77, 78. And uh, so we came up with this little, we had a jam and we came up with this tune, like, a, well, you know, it was rough and it was like just a, just an idea. And the, well, the plan was to, to, to go away and, and, you know, come up with a proper song based on this jam. Now, the, um, the, the people that paid for the session, the marijuana party, um, they took the tape and, and pressed about a hundred copies, which I own half of them <laughs> because I don't know whatever happened to the other half, but, um, uh, anyway, nothing more was thought of it. You know, it came out as a limited edition single, which was just the jam. So we were, I was pretty unhappy about that with the party that they did it, but, um, because, you know, it, it, it the original recording is pretty uh, pretty rough and it's you know it's not what we envisaged or what we thought we'd, we'd be able to come up with so it, all these years later and i you know during my work with um with youth which is not over it's a an ongoing thing but at one stage with television i was it was it was almost like um uh, uh, almost like a full-time job so to speak mm -hmm. um so my my support of decriminalizing um, uh, uh, cannabis or marijuana for uh, personal use is uh, I still hold that belief. I still hold that. But what's happened in the meantime is that um, it's because of my experience with Midday, which was the show that I worked on um, mm -hmm. as a reporter, um, I was introduced at a very, very early age to the idea that there's a medicinal application from cannabis genus or the genus that is cannabis. And um, so that, that as, as the years went by, we became more and more as a, as a society of the medicinal application of cannabis mm -hmm. and how wonderfully um, uh, therapeutic it can be. And um, in, in, a, in, in you know, uh, so many different ways. And I mean, we, we now know because, um, you know, depression and anxiety, not just because of the plague, but because, it, you know, our, our youth are going through some very, very difficult times, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you know, as far as the changing map of the world, so to speak. Right. Um, uh, we now know that it used in, um, uh, in a controlled uh, dosage, it, it, uh, it can help kids deal with anxiety and, and or depression. And I've dealt with both of those things in my life, depression and anxiety, uh, you know, predominantly depression. But, uh, you know, it, it, therapeutically, it can be used to, um, it, you know, um, help people through chemotherapy when they're dealing with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it can, um, one of the cases that I always use to, to argue the point or debate the point, argues the wrong choice of words, um, is um, a family that was very famous here in Australia where the father, uh, the child, less than, uh, I think it was six months old or whatever, and after a vaccination has started to have uh, seizures, this little girl. And by the time she was around about one years old, the seizures were coming about every 90 minutes and had intensified in their, in, in, in how extreme they were physically. And of course, this was, you know, obviously uh, infect, affecting her her mental stability and her ability to emotionally respond to her parents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very destructive uh, situation. A friend of the family suggested to the father that uh, he could supply cannabis oil, um, and this may help the child. And so they did a bit of reading on it. 
they went and found a GP, a general practitioner, a doctor, um, and they started to administer this oil to the child. And her seizures went from every about every 90 minutes, at least uh, once every two hours, but around about 90 minutes apart. Um, it went down to uh, like three or four seizures a day. Um, so they went from like one every hour and a half to two hours to two or three a day. The, the extremity of it was such that she uh, she was able to um, handle the, the seizure. It wasn't affecting her. She was becoming spasmodic in her body, you know, muscular sense. But she was what it was doing to her 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 her, her brain, her her thinking. Her, I mean, here's a, a one year old child trying to reason or, or bring some sort of you know, reason to to these. Uh, seizures so anyway someone in the they told the, the story that i was told was that um the, the child had a remarkable recovery and of course they were full of you know the enthusiasm of it is are you they, they, they told someone in the family or a family friend and this person um put them into the police and so he was arrested for obtaining and he would not tell the police where he got it from so they were they charged him with possession and and they also which was uh, terribly a uh, terrible injustice and terribly wrong they said that he was acquiring quantities for for supply which of course he wasn't he was supplying so it's a technicality i suppose anyway he went he, they put him in jail and uh, pending trial he came up for trial and a judge in in her infinite wisdom said um, I, I can not uphold the charge. Nice. You're not going to get a jail sentence. And um, you, you did what any other father would do yeah. uh, to, to, to relieve their child from this extreme situation. Mm. And um, the court gave them permission to. And so they, they started to obtain uh, cannabis oil um, medicinally um, in doses, you know, through prescription. But Right. Unfortunately, in Australia, unlike um, how progressive that Canada has, and, and I read what you sent me, but I've actually read stuff from right around the world, mm -hmm. and um, I'm very grateful. Thank you for that. Um, the um, in Australia, it's very, very hard. There's a lot of bureaucratic hoops to jump through, and it makes it all too difficult to uh, mm -hmm. to obtain a prescription. And of course, what's what's in question when when you talk to people that actually doctors and um, and patients that use cannabis um, in varying you know um, different forms, tablet form, oil mainly, smoke, whatever, vaporizers, you know those kind of things. Um, the the prescribed doses in in a lot of cases are too too low, too weak, but it's too hard, too expensive. And, and largely inadequate in its dosage. So I'm hoping that resurrecting, um, so now what, by way of explanation, I've moved from um, in the 70s supporting just, which I still support personally. It's not part of this, this crusade, so to speak, with Realize this time. This is more about medicinal use. And I think that it's about time as a society we realised we are missing a grossly missing a wonderful opportunity, you know, nature given, by the way, right. Um, right. Uh, to, to, to have this, um, I've spoken to GPs. Um, there's a wonderful woman here, Dr. Teresa Taupik, and she's written a wonderful book uh, about the medicinal use. I mean, it's one of uh, half a dozen books I might add. So I think, I think what we need to do is push the subject, keep pushing. Right so that um, we can change legislation mm -hmm. to decriminalise um, uh, the use of, but also make accessible, very accessible, potent doses that are applicable to the illness right. um, and, and also make it very, very easy and affordable mm -hmm. for people to access um, cannabis products. But it, and another thing, can I just mention very quickly? Yeah. The other, the other application too is that we're talking about a plant. 
that's come from the natural realm, right? So my, my spiritual connection is with the natural realm, the creational process. So I'm, I'm, I'm very... I'm very aware, if you like, um, of my connection, my personal connection, which goes back to talking about raising the kids. And I've, I've always instilled in them their personal connection with the divine, with the, the creational process. So cannabis is not invented. Some pharmaceutical company didn't come up with the idea. And then... You know, so it shouldn't be left in the hands of a pharmaceutical company per se. Um, there needs to be a government controlled body that is, is, is in position of all the facts. I mean, these days, you see, it's completely ecologically sound cannabis in all its forms, right? So the fibre from hemp can replace paper. So we don't need to cut down forests for wood shipping anymore. Um, uh, the it, it's, it can replace plastic. And if the plastic, like, you know, as we know, we've got this huge problem with plastic in our oceans, let alone our landfills. Right. Well, that solves the problem. Boom, right there. Right. Because it's so, because that's a natural fibre, it comes from the natural realm. Right. It's ecologically sound in every sense. So right. once it's, once you've had your use from it, now I'm I'm led to believe that that um, um, uh, hemp fiber can replace paper, uh, and you can produce A grade paper three or four or five times from the same bulk. Right. Then when it, when you've used up all its capability for paper, it can become cardboard, and then it can become chipboard. You can build houses out of it. I mean, Henry Ford at one stage, all those years ago. Uh, was 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 tying with the idea of compressing the fiber to make car panels. Wow. I mean, that was back in yeah. So, so the story goes. I mean, there's enough there's enough uh, documentation to suggest that um, it, the, you know car manufacturing can can uh, use it to this day. I mean, so it can replace uh, a lot of fiber, which brings us back to why did they outlaw hemp or cannabis in the first place i mean there's vested interests obviously historically um in, in a worldwide sense and i think it predominantly started in america mm -hmm. it's less than 100 years that it's been illegal to use well you, you can't make money off of it if you're a pharma company right bingo the other thing I was going to say, um, you were talking about your friend in a high profile place where their daughter was having the seizures because of a vaccine. Is that one of the recent vaccines we're talking about? Related? No, no, this was okay. this was like 15 years ago. Oh, OK, OK. Or possibly a little less, maybe 12 years ago. But uh, it was quite a famous case because um, the case was, uh, I think, hit the news about five years ago. Okay. And um, it, 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 he, he was arrested. And of course... The, the, the team of people that were around him uh, made it public and, and, and went to television, went to the press. Right. And, of course, it, it, press being what they are, mm. they sensationalised it, and then they forgot about him. Um, uh, but, but the people that, that were around him as a support group and the people from the Marijuana Party or the, the Cannabis Party, Cannabis... Mm. Um, um, the marijuana party is one party and the other one is is called you know cannabis uh, you, okay. you know, medicinal uses there so they rallied around him and raised money for his defense etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and um i might add at this time and um that um he was trying to get legal aid which is a a, a government supported yeah. legal initiative for um people that can't afford it mm -hmm. but a very high profile lawyer stepped forward and said um offer my uh, my services gratis or Probably so not. you know because this lawyer heard about the case and said well this is a, this is a, this is an injustice right and 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 when when they took the case to court of course the the judge in her infinite wisdom decided that it was an injustice as well so um he, he now you know is freed um um 
and and it helped um, people that came after that that are facing the same situation. But the thing about it is, we need to uh, and enhance the title and help. You know, I mean, I'll, you know, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but the title itself was quite prophetic because back in the early seventies. Uh, uh, realize legalize is just a play on words right it's, it's, it's yeah. when, when when lyric writers or song writers i just write lyrics i'm not at the stage now where i can supply, supply the music but i'm working on it but um <laughs> that's a bucket list i'm going to teach my, well i'm i'm getting taught to play guitar and keyboards finally um <laughs> never too but, late uh, yeah no never too late never too late at all and um yeah, and, and realise legal, and, and that's what we want people to do today, but mainly in the government. I and mean, people have to push for these things mm -hmm. because it, ultimately, at, at the end of the day, it's the Senate. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, the, 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 um, someone presents a paper and says, look, you know, like, I, I want a petition to change the law. Um, so, you know, they, they have to go through the process and it's, it's quite a lengthy and laborious process. So it, we've got to start somewhere. And I just kind of figured, um, and, 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 and I mean, let's face it, and I'm, I mean this in the, in the, in the best possible light, but mm. as, as our, the, the AA band's first single, um, we wanted to introduce ourselves um, in, if, for several different reasons. We wanted to make a mark, want to make a statement, but also, um, and I'm so grateful that uh, that you recognise um, the the music genre, if you like, of the first single because mm. it, it. When I gave it to the new bands, I said, "Look, I, I I want you to to come up with your treatment. I don't, you know." As long as I like it, and um, so they went away and they thought about it. Well, my, the main, the two main people, particularly, um, and um, they came back with that track, and I, I just loved it. And I just thought, mm. I, I, I said to Timmy, the guitar player, who's the MD in the band, I said, "What? How do you describe the music?" He said, "Well, I think it's like modern. You know, it's it's like today funk." Yeah, you know, when I think of funk, I always think of James Brown, who's great influence on me as a singer. Mm -hmm. But you know, in in recent years, of course, through my daughter, well, some years ago, um, I got to fall in love with um, oh, like Prince, probably okay. the probably the most predominantly funk. But you know, I went through that wonderful era of um, even though someone like myself wasn't supposed to like sort of uh, KC and the Sunshine Band or, right. um, yeah, you know, um, Boz Skaggs or whatever. But, but, you know, and, and yeah, yeah, Cool and the Gang and, um, you know, like the, the, the funksters of the 70s. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, yeah, I, I just, anyway, um, I just kind of thought, well, um it, the time is right i mean it actually says that in the lyric the time is yeah. right um we can't give up the fight because it's a fight about justice and it's a fight about it's a fight about putting humanity first mm -hmm. you know above legislation about, about um i mean um above the law of the land right um uh, going back to southern stars there's a wonderful saying that came out of out of Eureka Stockade, which was the catalyst for, for writing that album. Um, and it's a patch that I wear on my club vest because I'm, I'm a, uh, my motorcycle club is um, the Veterans. Right. And it used to be BBMC, which is Vietnam Veterans. But now because because of the new conflicts, I mean, there's a whole lot of young veterans. Right. So we've done the, the club Australia-wide it changed the patch from Vietnam veterans to just veterans. Mm -hmm. And anyway, um, I have that patch on my vest, my club vest. And, but it's, it's, a, it's a Eureka flag. A, a flag. Okay. Um, and, it, and the saying is when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty. Well, we're kind of going through that uh, worldwide right now in a lot of countries. Yes. Yeah.
Um, I, I've yeah. seen what's happened in Australia, and it's similar uh, here in Canada because we're both really? Commonwealth brothers. So I kind of thought, well, you know, I mean, yes, I mean, I'm aware of some anomalies, if you like, uh, with uh, Canadian politics, but it's it's not for me to talk about it because I'm not Canadian, but. Um, um, one of my favourite bunches of people, one of my favourite bands, but a bunch of people that we've toured with through, you know, over the, in recent years, when we were allowed to work and tour, right, right. is at a Canadian band called The Wild. And, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're in a, 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 I don't know if you're aware of them, but... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, musically, I mean, they're, you know, uh, they're force of nature. They're just, they're amazing. But, but, but as people... Mm. They're just they're just the best blokes. I mean, we, we became soul brothers very, very, very quickly um, because we we had the same passions. We had the same sort of views on, on humanity and life and, right. and rock and roll for a start. I mean, we, we both, like most people in rock and roll, I mean, as grandiose, all romantic as a concept as it is, we're on a mission. Right, it's like right. in the Blues Brothers, you know, we're right. on a mission from God, you know, like it's like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're here to bring joy and happiness into the world and, and to hopefully, you know, without getting bombastically over political, but we, you know, if you can stir people up to thought. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favourite tracks off um, Can't Be Beaten, uh, uh, Scar for Life is Can't Be Beaten. And yeah. it's written about, it's a it's written about standing up as an individual and if you don't agree with the government we'll question it you know like right. um and, and never so so ne uh, more so than it is now right. getting back to southern uh, getting back to southern stars i am so grateful i've got to say man that, that's just outstanding that you recognize southern stars because i mean lyrically i think it's some of the best stuff that i've ever done no um, I'm, 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 uh, Thank you for bringing it to us, for sure. Um, it, it, but it was it was it was inspired entirely. Its root source was was um, because the, the Eureka Stockade, for those that don't understand it, was um, a rebellion against um, uh, the Crown in uh, in Victoria. Right, and it was it started because of um, uh, the unfair treatment of miners that were uh, by the military, which was the constabulary, which was later to become the police. Right. Um, and they were extorting money out of these people, um, uh, illegally, as it turned out, hmm. immorally, always, yes. And um, they were very brutal in the execution of their duties, as as they were in those days. Right. And, right. and it, it, it got to the point where there was so much resentment that there was a group of people that said, you know, you know, we're gonna we're gonna stand up for our rights, and um, we're not gonna, you know, we're, gonna, we're not gonna take this oppression anymore. So, um, as we have, the larger story of Eureka Stockade is is quite an amazing part of Australian history, which I might add, they're trying to in this politically correct age we live in, they're trying to downplay the real. Um, movement that was behind the Eureka Stockade. They said, oh no, no, it was a, a localized rebellion. Well, yes, it was, but it was it was supposed to be a flashpoint. Mm -hmm. And um because a lot of the early immigrants in Australia were were from the British Isles or from you know UK as we know it. Right. So they were English, they were Irish, they were Scottish, etc. But there was all because of the gold rush, there was there was quite a few Americans here. And so they they said, look, there's, there's going to be a, a movement. And, and it was the first, it was the only step towards becoming a republic. And they, was, they sent overseas for more troops, for mm. more uh, uh, activists. They weren't army troops, but they would, you know, they would come here to resist the army. So um, a, as would have it, you know, the English uh, were brutal in suppressing any uh, insurrection or just you know like any um uh, movement uh, right. that you know sort of yeah. wanted to overthrow yeah. them so um they brutally attacked the eureka stockade and um annihilated them and um hunted them down in the weeks ensuing after that and 
uh, killed them and their families and uh, tried to stamp it out completely. Mm. And, and that's where that um, saying came from, when injustice becomes law, resistance becomes duty, which is something I've always lived by um, since I was a kid, um, right. having been brought up in, a, um, uh, I suppose, what you'd call a, a Labor stroke Republican unionised family. Okay. Uh, of course, now I'm very, very conservative in my views. Um, I think one of the great wisdoms, and I, um, it's one of the wisdoms of, uh, there's a book I've got um, on quotes, and um, I think it was attributed to Churchill. And I think it's a fabulous, and you call him what you like, a warmonger or a drunk, whatever, but he had a wonderful way with words and he understood uh, many levels of just not the English language, but humanity per se. Right. And he right. said, if you're not a liberal, as in your understanding of a liberal, so if you're not a lefty, when you're young, you don't have a heart. If you're not a conservative, when you matured, you don't have a brain. And I think that's, I mean, in my case, see, like I started, like I said, I started out in a very left aligned, by Australian standards. Right, right. A, right. a unionised family, very left, very working class, very labour, you know, strength of the worker and all that, which I still uphold to this day. But... Mm. The Labor Party or the left movement right around the world has is no longer representative of the worker. It's about, you know, it's about climate change and it's about resetting, what do they call it? The, uh, the reset yeah. of, our, of our economic structure, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But, you know, if you want to, we could talk about that another day. Yeah, for sure. Um, just got one more question, Angry. I know I've taken up some of your time here. Uh, Mate, I'm, I'm, I'm having a ball. You go right ahead, <laughs> brother. With uh, the Angry Anderson Band, are you going to be re uh, releasing an album? Do you have any tracks written? And yeah. um, if you do, um, I've noticed on your uh, TATS um, website there's some Euro European dates, but I also noticed somewhere else that there's American dates. Are you, are you touring the States next year? Well, who knows? <laughs> With the plague being what it is, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's maybe two distinct sides to that issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, we're all subject to rules and regulations. So yeah. whether we agree with it or not, or whether we think that it's a, you know, I think it's an, an absurd overreaction. But having said that, Hundred um, percent. There's no, there's no denying that there's a, there's a problem that we have to deal with. So, yeah. uh, both Europe and America, um, the rescheduled dates from not last, not this year, but last year, um, <clears throat> come December this year, it'll be two years that we've been living with this situation. Um, we yeah. were, yeah. we were a week into uh, like our usual. Uh, four or five weeks in Europe, um, not last March, but March before, mm. um, and we got sent home. So that whole year, which included Europe, or maybe two tours of Europe, uh, you, um, our first tour of America since um, since since eighty three. Eighty three. Okay. Um, yeah. So it, they, all those dates have been rescheduled for next year. Okay. I might add. Um, one of the things that myself, uh, you know, the Tats and and um, and and the Wild have talked about is is us doing dates and and the guy uh, who's booking us or who was who was put this tour together. It's a club tour. Mm -hmm. um, he, he he wants to do at least three or four, maybe yeah, three or four dates in Canada as well. That would be great. We'd love to see you here. Um, yeah. If you don't get up to Canada, definitely when you guys get to, um, if it happens, Flint, Michigan is close to me. Well, yeah. theoretically. So I'll definitely head down to see you, uh, Angry. It's, it's been quite a pleasure. There's so much more we can talk uh, about. So maybe we'll have to do a part two. I'm up for it, brother. I'm up for it. I mean, like I said, I when, when I, you know, like, 
Yeah, I mean, it, there's very few people that you uh, you meet that are objectionable or unlikable people, and there's very few experiences that I that I that I don't enjoy now. But I've enjoyed today immensely. Thank you. Um, I would love to talk more about uh, not just the AA band, but particularly about the Tats and, and about music. I've been fascinated, uh, just knocked out by you choosing Southern Stars. And there's a whole story about Southern Stars, um, uh, which, which, which we could, if we, and, and graciously I'll accept an invitation, another invitation to talk, but we could talk. I, I'd love to be, because you identify that album, I'd love to talk to you about the song content of that album. Perfect. One of my favorite songs is the pirate song. <laughs> yeah, that's there's a story right there. That's kind of uh, a we, gay kind of a feel. And we got a we got a couple of minutes. I'll tell you a great story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, were, we were I wrote the lyric to it, um, before, obviously before we, we did the album. So we 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 were in a we we're in England for our first um uh, I think it was 80 and we went 80, 81. But anyway, having said that, we were in, we were in England and we were touring uh, around Europe from England. We based ourselves, these days we base ourselves in Europe, in Germany. Um, but yeah, so uh, anyway, we, um, we were doing this, uh, a gig. It was a big circus tent. Um, I think it was called the Hippodrome. And okay. It was in Paris. And um uh, there was a, a huge French band on then, um, um, Trust, a uh, great band, tr terrific band, and, and us, and there was one other, and the other act was like a huge act, it was kind of like, oh, you know, it could have been sort of, um, I was thinking maybe the Scorpions or something like that, but I don't think it was, I think it might have been Halford's band. Okay. But anyway, it was, it was a big show, and anyway... One of the crew came back to us and said, mate, there was, there was a couple of the Stones were here. Oh, wow. And were watching the, were watching the band. And we, and we went, like, you mean Rolling Stones? And they said, well, yeah. There was a couple of them were here. And I said, when they said, who? And I said, well, Keith and, and um, uh, I think uh, Charlie Watts. And okay. um, anyway, they've, um, I remember at a press conference out here years later they they said to they were doing a press conference and they said like do you know anything about australian bands and is there any australian bands you like and uh, keith richard said yeah there's a band out here called rose tattoo we saw them in in europe and uh you know i just love the slide player nice and because he's you know keith's no yeah. slouch as a, as a slide player himself anyway getting back to paris so we said, oh, you know, that's great. You know, did they enjoy the show sort of thing? And it was a really, really good night. And um, they said, yeah, they loved it. And they invited you to come back to this um, bar, um, just just a couple of doors up from Crazy Horse, you know, which is uh, okay. the burlesque sort of thing. So, you know, we thought, wow, we're going to hang out with the Stones, right? You know, so we get invited to the bar and they hadn't arrived yet. And we were there and the, uh, the tour manager said, you know, and I... You know the, the the bar owner knew that we were it's apparently it was their hang. Okay, where they used to hang here all the time. They had a private room out the back and all this kind of stuff. So we're at the bar, you see, and I'm um, I'm trying to you know we waiting for them. They arrived fashionably late, obviously. And anyway, you know we, we went out a few during the gig, and we're here having a few more. You know, and so I was feeling pretty. So I spotted this young. Uh, French woman, so I've sort of sidled up to her and said, "Ah, oh, good day," you know. Like, and she goes, "Oh, what your strange way you speak?" And I said, "Oh, I'm Australian." She goes, "Oh, Australian." She said, never met an Australian before. She said, "What do you do?" And I said, "I'm a singer in a rock band, Rose Tattoo." And she goes, "Oh, you don't look like a singer in a rock and roll band," <laughs> and because I don't, right? At that stage, they were all sort of tall and skinny and long hair and shit yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway so i said okay so i went back to the table and the guys were giving me a bad time about trying to chat up this woman she was a stunner by the way yeah. so anyway i go back to the uh, i go back to the bar and and she said oh here's our little rock and roll singer 
Inferno. <laughs> and um, and I said, look, I'm not really a rock and roll singer. And she goes, oh, I didn't think so, with the French accent. She goes, yeah. so what, what do you do? I said, I'm a pirate. <laughs> and she said, she said, oh, you look like a pirate. <laughs> so I wrote the I wrote the pirate song. I but, want to be a pirate. <laughs> that's a great song. It, only if you had an eye patch. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, like when I was a kid, one of my favorite uh, movies, I mean, I was, I was addicted to movies because, you know, that was the, the movie theater was something we went to every weekend. Right. Um, every Saturday there was, you know, the matinee, you know, and the, you know, all, the, all the local kids went there. And I became addicted to, and still to this day, I've got a huge collection of, of but um, there was um, there was a character in those days, Gregory Peck played him, I okay. think it was Gregory Peck, uh, uh, Captain Horatio Hornblower. Okay. And he was a, he was a, um, uh, but I, I loved sailing ships. Right. And uh, I love the whole thing about, you know, buccaneers and pirates and that whole romantic story um one of my and i have a, a complete collection uh there's a a writer called patrick o'brien who uh, the movie master and commander or master commander is based on his books um which i think is a brilliant movie but um i've always had a a, a wonderful what well, would i say i've always had this affectionate relationship to to all things under sail in the Napoleonic era, you know, like so, mm-hmm. the, the the really truly romantic era of sail of, mm-hmm. of men going, not just and, and of course later on exploration wise, I mean, mm-hmm. men sailed around and ridic- around the world in ridiculously small, inadequate craft and and mm-hmm. um, ships and and discovered you know the new world. Right. Uh, so, you know, the romance of the sea has never been, you know, it's always been a, a, a but yeah, that's, I, and I said to this woman, I'm, I'm a pirate. And she said, oh, of course, you look like a pirate. Because <laughs> I, to, to her way of understanding in 1980, I looked like a pirate. I didn't look like a rock singer. So well, I wrote the pirate song. The next, the next time I listen to that will probably be a little bit later tonight or tomorrow. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll think of that and I'll listen closer to the lyrics, Angry. Yeah, yeah. That that's that that's the reason that that, that that I wrote that song. I just thought, like, I'll show you, you know, because she just brushed me away. I, I brushed me off. I mean, I, I wasn't a rock star. I wasn't wealthy, you know. But, but the, the people in this bar were there to meet people like the Rolling Stones. Yeah. They. Oh, oh, that's the other part of the story. They eventually arrived, right? And they, they come in. They go, "Oh, the Stones are here. The Stones are here." You know, like so. Everyone sort of stood up you know to say hello and as they walked through they, they had all their bodyguards and stuff and um you know us being the cheeky australians and i went hey keith we're over here can't have a drink and i just saw this hand it was bill wyman and um and uh, uh charlie wasn't there and i think it was um keith or ronnie okay but they just sort of looked over and waved like that uh and that was it that was our experience with the stones. They just that was, your, that, was meet, that was your meet and greet. Yeah, that was our moment, you know, with with the stones. <laughs> it was so funny, and they just sort of as 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 the door was closing to that private part, they turned around, and went, "Cheers, lads!" You know, nice. or one of them did, and um, and that was it. Boom! That was it. So that was that's my Rolling Stones story. Well, that's more than I got. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, there you go. It's been anyway. Great, it's been a great pleasure, Angry. Um, Thank you. I'm going to uh, definitely um, put the links to um, your website and everything so that people can uh, go and take a, a peek at uh, Realize Legalize, and um, hope to hear from you soon with an album coming out and a tour in Canada, hopefully, and in the states for sure. And in the meantime, uh, I'll get a hold of a cat in maybe six months, and maybe we'll do part two. Sooner, if you like, early next year. We do. I I will bring you up to date on the album. Okay. And I'll tell you the story behind it because we've we've resurrected some old tracks of mine. We're writing new tracks, um, and we might even include a couple of covers on it as okay. well. 
Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a, it's like I said, it's a very interesting project. It's it's a very faces sounding band, um, but we, we've we've not really tied ourselves down to anything. Um, okay. we, we're just going to explore all the kinds of musics that we that we enjoy together, and 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 make it a um, you know because the, the the tats is so defined. Yeah, the rosy tarts will always be. You know that that blues based you know uh, oh. sort of band and 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 so it should be because it's mm. it's a very very identifiable our animal but um with the aa band we're just gonna we're just gonna go we're just gonna go where the music takes us so to speak perfect all right you have yourself a good morning my friend thank you and um thank well i'll thank Kat myself but once again it's been a pleasure thank you mate thank you Cheers.